Marianne and welcome to the Mary Jess Meets podcast. Hello, Mary Hello. Jess, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. I just got to say, look at those beautiful instruments in the background. <laughs> oh my goodness. Tell How us many about hops? the harps. It's too many harps. <laughs> <laughs> So I've got my, this is my orchestral salvi harp, and then my harpsicle harp here, the maple one, and then my touring harpsicle harp from made of cherry wood behind there as well. Wow, <laughs> they are so beautiful. Which one did you start learning first? Well, I grew up learning the orchestral pedal harp. Um, so, I mean, I didn't actually get that one until I was 17, 18, but essentially the full size harp. And then... Um, it kind of fell by the wayside a bit, you know, when I, when I got into music. <clears throat> but I joined a medieval folk band called Jogleressa a few years ago, and they had a harpsicle harp. And I was like, what is this amazing instrument? It's a small harp, but it sounds like a big harp. It's so resonant and sonorous and beautiful. And I, I fell in love with it so much that I got my own one. And then I started gigging and touring because you can put it on your back you can put that one in a case and put it on your back get on the train it goes on an airplane and then when I went to America on tour the Reese Harps who make Harps Cool Harps um they gave me that one and I'm now a sponsored artist of Harps Cool Harps so that's that's great <laughs> and now the harp is a big part of my life again <laughs> Wow, well that's amazing and a huge congratulations for being a sponsored artist of theirs. Thank uh, you. Just, your heart playing is so beautiful. One of the first things that I heard of your music stopped me dead in my tracks. Oh. I was doing a scroll as we do through social media, this is on my Instagram, <laughs> and your Oh Holy Night that you did with your gorgeous vocals, all the layered vocals and your harp accompaniment just stopped me dead in my tracks. It just oh. took my breath away and was so beautiful. I'm going to link it up here somewhere <laughs> <laughs> so that people can hear it because it was absolutely beautiful. And that was you accompanying yourself on the harp as well, wasn't it? Yeah, so I did some piano, some harp, and then vocals, like um, solo and backing vocals. Yeah. And that yeah. was that was this little harp, that one. Gosh. So really nice. <laughs> it was so beautiful. And with your oh, vocals. you're so kind. Well, it was. I'm telling the truth. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> and I love, not only do I love layered vocals and harmonies, but your vocal, it, it sounds like you've got some classical roots there. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I, mean, I love, love the harmonies as well and come from a choral classical background. So that's probably where all those harmonies come from. Yeah, um, I, I read something. Didn't you say that you um, studied choral classical music at Cambridge? That's pretty crazy amazing. <laughs> yeah, I studied music at Cambridge and I was a choral scholar as well. So that was a pretty, pretty amazing choral education because I hadn't done choral singing in a big way before that like I hadn't been a part of a cathedral choir or anything so it was a steep learning curve going and joining the Keys Chapel Choir at Cambridge but also you know amazing and we went on tour places and did you know live BBC radio even songs and um, BBC proms and all, all sorts of things that were just such an incredible learning experience so I'm really grateful for that experience. Yeah, that's amazing. And what was it like applying and trying to get into Cambridge? Like the Oxbridge universities are just so well known throughout the world of being so difficult to get into. What was that process? Yeah, it was, it, I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> like I, yeah, cause I hadn't done any choral singing before. I didn't, I hadn't even sung in a, my, my state school was a girls only state school. Uh, and so I hadn't even sung with tenors and basses like properly. And so I remember at like the choral auditions, I was just so green, <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. I, I remember they laughed at me cause I, they said, do you have any, you know, church experience background? And I was like, yeah, but it's like very low church of England. And they thought it was hilarious that I did a hand sign for low rather than high church of England. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> um, yeah, but obviously they, they they liked something even though I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> they, but... Yeah, well, they saw your talent. They must have done. <laughs> That's just, it's absolutely amazing that you, you know, were able to start on that journey because so often 
when children are starting out in music and they say, what should I do? I say to them, well, join a choir. You learn so much. You do, you do. And it's just, just nothing like singing with other people, I think. I mean, I say this like now as a solo artist as well, there's still nothing like the feeling of singing with a group of people. There's some deep human connection, I think, that like why as humans we always feel the need to make music and to sing and express ourselves that way. And then when you do it together, it's like, it's just, it's just wonderful. Yeah, you're completely I would tell right. anyone to join a choir, you know. Yes, well, I'm glad you agree. And I know yeah. that you also have gone on to do lots of collaborations, um, but through many different genres, because after Cambridge, you went on to do a postgrad in musical theatre. That's, yeah. that, <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it's a change, but it's also still with people. So it's, um, yeah. it's lovely when you do get to have that feeling of togetherness, especially when you're a solo artist as well. But before mm. we get on to your solo artistry, can you tell us more about your musical theatre that you went into? Well, yeah, so I'd always danced all my life and quite hard, like really into it, like really into ballet and jazz and stuff. So I love classical music, but I didn't feel like I wanted to only do choral and classical or, or opera. I love opera as well, but I didn't feel like that was all I wanted to do. I kind of like really enjoyed kind of becoming a character, being part of a, like a big production where it's sometimes I find like the the rigidity of the classical concert structure to be a little restrictive you know oh you must sit, stand up at this time sit down at this time don't clap at the wrong moment and all these things and it's kind of like quite exciting and fun to become a character to be able to express as a character through dance acting singing so I was like ah, I'm gonna go and like pick up my dancing again and like see where that takes me <laughs> and it was very intense going back um to dance college effectively but also really great fun and then led me down this like theatre and theatre route for for quite some time which had lots of adventures <laughs> and was really really cool <laughs> which adventures were those um well one of the first things i did after i graduated was um went to the edinburgh fringe with a group of um fellow students and from lanes where i went and they they'd written a comedy sketch show and so i went as like the musical director playing the piano but also like being in the show with them and you know, Edinburgh Fringe is just so much fun. <laughs> like, it's, there's so much going on. I met so many other performers, saw so many other shows. You feel really inspired by the fact that people are there with their own show, making things happen and creating new works. And um, just, I just saw so much as well. Like I ended up depping in somebody else's show a bit. And then I went back the next year and I was in like three different shows. And it's just, I mean, it's just crazy. Like you see so you comedy, like musical theater. I saw classical things as well. My friend was there with, um, she was a Talis scholars, I think. So I went and like saw them and there's just so much going on. It's just so exciting. So I feel, I feel like, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival sort of changed my life because it's sort of opened up this new world of like possibility of not just being uh, like sitting around being like, okay, well, I have to wait for an audition to come in or it's like, oh, you could go out and create something yourself. And it's really hard work, but it's also like exciting to create something new, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And those opportunities that you, you create for yourself are often the most rewarding as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can see how Edinburgh Fringe would be inspiring. I've never been. I really <laughs> want to go. <laughs> when when life starts back again, like you have to go. It's so much fun. I mean, there's just like a buzz about the whole city because everybody's there to to see to see. I, I, it's not just theatre. I'm trying to think of you know, it's an arts festival, isn't it? And and arts is what it is. There's art all over the town. There's street performers. There's it's just such an exciting buzz about the place that you feel 
like excited to be alive when you're there you know <laughs> well I will look forward to feeling that feeling of being excited <laughs> to be alive <laughs> being out of my house <laughs> going and experiencing yeah, those I, things what's it like to be out of the house I'm not sure yeah. these days <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> oh my gosh. So what opportunities did you create for yourself off the back of going to Edinburgh Fringe? What did that inspire for you? Um, I'm trying to think like if there was like a direct uh, kind of like stepwise cor- correlation uh, and also like it was, it was a few years ago now. So I'm trying to think chronologically about what, what I know actually I got, I remember I came back from the Edinburgh Fringe um and I'd met some people in Edinburgh and then I ended up like going to Paris with them just just for fun um and then I went and did Thursford straight after that for like Great. three months so it was all like a you know like you know you graduate and you're suddenly like out in the world and then just like having these new adventures and Thursford was like such a brilliant experience I ended up doing it four years in a row um I feel like I should maybe explain what Thursford is for anyone who doesn't know what Thursford is. <laughs> go on, go on, you explain it's, it for us. It's a, uh, it's in the it's in the middle of Norfolk. It's a village in the middle of Norfolk. But um, John Cushing put on puts on this show, which I would call a, um. It's it's kind of like a classy variety show. They have they have an orchestra, of about thirty five people. They have choir of sixty singers. Um, a troupe of like 25 dancers um, they usually have like a comedian maybe an acrobat or something and it's we just do a variety of things so there'll be some classical choral numbers some orchestral numbers um, some more musical theater review type things um, Christmas some Christmas songs because it's, it's around Christmas time and it's just I mean, it's a really amazing show. Like, it's like over about 150 performers in this wow. show. And there are, I think, I think almost 150,000 people go to see the show every year in total because it runs from the start of November till Christmas and there's two shows a day, virtually every day. So it's a full on job as a performer, um, but it's also so much fun. And you, again, you, you meet so many other musicians. The, and what's great is you're meeting dancers singers and orchestral musicians and you're all working together and as a really great community vibe with the cast and the crew and everything and it's it's so much fun especially because you're doing different genres and that I think that you and I both share is I never just wanted to do one genre like I love lots of different genres and so the great thing about Thirstford was like one minute you're in a choral number where you're singing like you're singing howls and uh, holst and stuff. Then, then you're singing oh holy oh holy night. Then you're singing um, another opening, another show. Then you're doing a number from um, Phantom of the Opera. You're doing masquerade and this big ball gown. And then you change and like I was doing like gymnopedy, like in this floaty dress and but singing like a high line over it. Then they have a carousel there. Then you're like on the carousel, like in this fun number where everyone's dancing. And there's just, it's so, you're going from like all these different, one thing to another. And it's so much fun to be doing all these different genres. And you're watching other people be incredible at their craft, the dancers. I mean, I trained in dancing, but ended up being a, what do they call it? A singing dancer, like. So a, a singer that can dance not I wouldn't ever be just a dancer like not quite good enough <laughs> for that and you're watching these dancers like do the can-can and stuff and you're like wow <laughs> and then the orchestral musicians do their own number and they they're so fun they'll like do this number where they each take a little solo and it's just so it, it, inspiring seeing people who are amazing at their craft <laughs> Yeah, it sounds it. You're selling it to me. Honestly, <laughs> it sounds really good. Yeah. And it must be so nice to be with such talented people and be able to share so many different types of that art of performance art with them as well. It's yeah. amazing the stories that you hear working with other people as well. 
Yeah, because then, and then, you know, in, in life, in all the other jobs I've ended up doing, I'll, always, I'll often run into someone that I worked with at Thursford because we're all in different areas of the music industry. A lot of the people in the orchestra, say, are session players. So then I do a lot of session work as well. So then I'll, like, inevitably run into them on a session job where they're in the they're in the orchestra or recording for someone. And it's, it's just it's just really nice to to expand your network to other people but the thing about Thursford is so many people have never heard of it and it's this massive show that yeah like nearly 150,000 people see every year but it's uh it's kind of in the middle of nowhere so everybody takes a special trip to see it and like makes a little holiday of it and Norfolk is have you have you been to Norfolk it's so beautiful I love it there yeah I've never been before but it's so beautiful I love Norfolk I absolutely love it so I've been back a couple of times to visit or for like I had another gig up there and I was like I'm gonna I'm gonna visit because it's so beautiful there I love it so yeah it sounds like it and it sounds like when the world is back to normal we should take a special trip <laughs> oh my gosh we should yeah. go book a ticket take a special trip <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well you brought up session work and that was something I really wanted to ask you about because obviously you've done all this amazing live work but now as we see you you're sat behind a mic and I know that you've done a lot of session work and a lot of BVs uh, you've worked with so many amazing musicians putting backing vocals on their recordings yeah I'm very very fortunate and I should yeah say for anyone someone the other day said to me what are you talking about what's BVs and it's backing vocals <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I've been very fortunate to do backing vocals for a lot of great people. Um, like, uh, Come on, you're going to have to list him now. You two, Radiohead, Sam Smith, Imogen Heap, Charlotte Church, <laughs> all of these names. <laughs> yeah. like, goodness me. Can you tell us about, like, start with whichever one you want, but I know that, um, you've had some amazing experiences working with these people. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're all so, I mean... I can honestly say like that they're, they're all legends like Charlotte Church is such a legend um because we um I was with a, a, a group of some singers and the thing that was so great about Charlotte Church is we were we were doing backing vocals for her new record that she'd written and produced with her partner and she had some really complicated choral parts going on and when we came to rehearse with her like she she knew all of the parts and she can sing anything like her voice is so incredible it's not like just what you see on the tv but she can actually do it live at any moment and she would be like you know she'd just demonstrate oh, you do it kind of like this and it, and she's so much fun and she'd been so involved in the process and that was inspiring for me as well because I was just kind of like edging into writing my own well I was always writing my own music but wanting to do something about it and watching Charlotte Church work was very, uh, yeah, very inspiring because she's not only a fantastic singer, like she obviously is a like, fantastic singer, but uh, also so involved in the creative process and like really knows what she wants creatively and created this whole show around the record too where she had visuals, she had costumes, she had the lights show and she had envisaged it all very specifically and actually we were she made a BBC made a documentary about it um so we're in the BBC documentary like where she's talking about how she was putting this record together and how the live show matched up with the record wow um, that's yeah, really cool and then you two were so nice that was, that was again that was a BBC thing that we ended up doing backing vocals with them for the you two at the BBC which was at Abbey Road Studios and I mean, I just love any excuse to go to Abbey Road. It's it's amazing, and and you two were just they they were very charming, really lovely, and it was. I mean, when you see me in the in the in the show, I just can't stop smiling because it's, it's like I I watched you two at Glastonbury years ago, like stood in the rain watching them, and I never ever thought one day I'd be stood behind them singing with them. It's like how did that happen how did that happen <laughs> <laughs> and then likewise like recording with Radiohead so was re recording backing vocals for their latest album at Moonshape Pool and I think when I did the day in the studio I was so focused on 
trying to get it right, you know, do a good job. And it was quite experimental. They were like, try doing it like this, try try doing it like that. There was a lot of like pitch shifting going on, different parts. And so I didn't really know how much they were going to use of it. I didn't really think, I was like, oh, they might not use anything that we did. And then when the record came out and I could like hear myself on six tracks, I was, then I was giddy. Then I was like, this Radiohead, I, I, I am such a big fan of Radiohead. <laughs> like, as a teenager, like, discovering Radiohead's music, just like, wow, this is so amazing. And as a classical musician, discovering Radiohead and being like, they use the octatonic scale. <laughs> I remember being so excited that, like, just has the octatonic scale in it. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. And it's so great that you're able to really enjoy all these different types of music. Because like you said, we really do have that in common where we don't want to be limited to just one genre. And so your mm. versatility has allowed you to make the most of all of these crazy, amazing opportunities to work with these people. But I know that Radiohead, that session was the session where you met the wonderful Daisy Shoot, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So it was like really like, just, again, one of those key moments in life where that's where I met Daisy. And then um, she ended up asking if I would do se session vocals with for a Burberry job with a, the composer Ilan Ashkeri. And so then we got to know each other even better through doing that job. And I'd, I'd actually already done quite a bit of work with Burberry, but not with Ilan. And so it was great getting to um, work on that. And then Daisy and I got to be friends and realized we were both doing the singer songwriter thing on the London circuit and started, you know, just like gigging together quite a bit. And then eventually we kind of like, were like having these conversations where we'd be frustrated about often being the only woman in the studio or the only woman on a lineup or the only woman in the band. And then we were just kind of became a like what, well, why don't we start a collective for women in music? So we we did. We started Herd Collective, um, which is we put on like live gigs with lineups with female artists, and it, we're just trying to encourage a community really of of women who can work together, support each other, kind of share advice, just be a network. And I've met so many great women in music through through the fact that like then you work with someone and they'll say oh you, you should you should check out so and so and then you then you meet them and get to know them better and you know the network grows and that's been really inspiring and yeah Daisy and I've been to Poland together and America and like gone on some adventures there so again I got Radiohead to thank for that <laughs> Thank you, Radiohead. Thank you, Radiohead. <laughs> That's amazing. And I'm going to have to link to, well, so many things below, but the Herd Collective is definitely going to be one of them that I can link to because it's just such a great community that you've built up with the Herd Collective. So many talented people. And I remember Daisy telling me a staggering figure that there was just a tiny amount of female producers. I'm going to mm -hmm. have to ask her what that percentage was so I can link to it down below, but it was It's so 1%. Small. 1%? 1% of producers are female, 2% of engineers, sound engineers are female. Um, that statistic is probably from 2018 because what with everything that went on last year, I'm not sure if we've got the updated statistics, um, but even if it's like, it's shocking. It's shocking, 1%. Really shocking. Uh, female and even in PRS which is the British um, Writers Society only 17 might now be 18 percent of um, the registered composers and songwriters are female which I think is shocking as well because there are so many brilliant female writers and composers and they're just not getting the same platform because um, interestingly, and like I know there's somebody called Vic Bain who's doing a lot of really interesting research into this. She said that when you look at music graduates coming out of college or university from studying any number of music related jobs, could be music business, could be production, could be singing, performing, it's roughly 50% male, female. So there are lots of qualified women 
but somewhere along the way it drops off because the industry is not always very welcoming and kind to women and because it's quite male dominated it can be a very intimidating place as a as a woman especially in some of the areas where there there are fewer women like in the studio because there's only one percent female producers two percent engineers the studio particularly can be quite uh, an intimidating place as a woman I know that myself I've felt quite I mean intimidate is kind of the the best word for it because there's this attitude persists even if it's like low-key subconscious that oh women don't know what they're talking about they're not technical you know you just sing and like look nice kind of thing don't you worry the men the men will deal with the knobs like <laughs> oh, that makes and you so kind angry. of like <laughs> i'm like oh, i think pretty sure i like at least deserve an opinion here like <laughs> oh my goodness like, I can't believe those figures. They are staggering. I just, I, I did a little that blows my mind kind of <laughs> um, <laughs> action with my hands when you said that. I just can't believe that that's the case. Um, but looking back on all of the studios that I've been in and all of the recordings that I've done when you've gone in, that's the case. I've never worked mm -hmm. with a female engineer in a studio. Yeah, which is it's a shame, isn't it? That's crazy. I'm glad to say that I have worked with a, a female producer before. That's great. Um, and she is amazing. So uh, I know one person, but like one. Oh, what's her name? <laughs> her name's Jess, Jessica. I'll Actually, I'll link to her stuff below as well because it's amazing. But yeah, yeah, that's only one person, actually. One I know. female. I just... And actually, I, I, and I'm, I'm, you know, I think we're, we're always guilty of ourselves. Like I, I ended up producing my EP. But I didn't think I could. I didn't think I was a producer. I didn't think that that was a role that I could take on because it's so true that if you don't, if you if you don't see it, if you can't see it, you can't be it. They say, and it's it's funny how much that is subconsciously true. If you don't see those role models, you just it often just doesn't occur to you that that is something that you could do. And I also felt like, oh, I don't know about the the technical side of things like uh you know i i don't I'm not sure about the technical side and, and since lockdown last year i've ended up learning how to home record and um do a lot more of this tech stuff and i was kind of like oh it turns out i can do it but just nobody ever tells you that nobody c gives the same encouragement i think to women like yeah you you can do the technical stuff there's an assumption from other people and from ourselves Oh, I can't, I can't do that. You know, that's all, that's a bit complicated. I'm not very technical because that's what you kind of, or people expect. Wow. That's so interesting. And I'm sure a lot of women have experienced everything that you've just said, um, which is why the Herd Collective is, well, I know it's a great movement and a great community that you've built, but that just highlights its importance and why it's mm. so important so that women do have that community around them and they do have those role models that they can look to um so i'm definitely going to link to that below because i feel it's oh, really thanks. important <laughs> but now that you've spoken about creating your own music and your debut ep like doing it yourself we, we've got to know more about that now that you've brought it up because i just <laughs> i really want to talk to you about this and creating your own music so please do tell us all about your debut ep well, it came out last year and um, it was a long time coming. <laughs> I I took quite a while over it. It's called Caught in the Dark and it was about my relationship with the darkness and searching for light. So I decided that like ev every song kind of was represented by a different colour. So I ended up having that in mind in how the songs were produced and then also the artwork too, because I paint, we well, see some of the paintings like... <laughs> over there so I ended so up doing creative. all these paintings and everything for it as well which I hadn't envisaged I would do before but when and I know that we've kind of touched on this ourselves and personal conversations but when you're an independent artist you don't realize how much there is involved in releasing um an EP or an album or, or anything there's you have to do everything. So it's like, yeah, I have to consider the artwork, the graphic design, the branding. Then as like, okay, I'm recording, so I'm I'm also producing it. Like just so many 
elements you have to take on and in, in one sense it's like when you've done it it's really rewarding <laughs> it's like wow I did that awesome great but when you're doing it sometimes it feels like I'm never going to be able to do this I'm never going to be able to get this done I, there's all these big jobs like graphic design like checking the mix checking the master but then there's all these like fiddly things like learning about um the ISRCs registering with PPL and PRS barcodes and <laughs> like distributors like there's just a million things to try and consider and then you kind of just like oh man I just I just want to make music but <laughs> I also have to consider like PR, branding, marketing, like distribution, all these other social media, like all these other elements that is a lot to, to take on and yeah and think about. <laughs> Absolutely, it's a lot to take on and think about. And the learning curve is like this. There's, there's no slope to Just it. Like, yes. It's like... <laughs> Actually, I found a great GIF um, last year about learning curves, which was when you're all excited and you're about to learn about this new thing and you know it's going to be a learning curve, but you run straight to it. And then I just found a GIF of a woman running straight into a brick wall. <laughs> I was like, this is how I feel. <laughs> yep, yeah, that's how, that's, that's how I feel. Um, and I think... Often, like you stand at the bottom of that mountain and you just go, I just don't know. I, I don't know how I'm ever going to get up that. Like, how, where's the path even start? Um, and so I'm taking a very roundabout way about trying to explain my, my EP. But I think I was putting off releasing anything. Like, once I'd gone through the ordeal and the trauma of getting them recorded and everything, I then was like, well, I, I have no idea where to start with releasing. And I ended up doing this gig. Um, called creative mornings and there was a speaker ella saltmarsh she was talking about courage she said if you wait to feel courageous you'll never act don't wait for courage to find you like just do it so and i was like okay this is like a sign it's a sign i have to like just set a date and make it happen and so that was like the impetus to set the first single date and that is what i've had to do at each stage along the way so it's like, okay if I set a date and I like make myself accountable, then it's going to happen. So finally released the EP last April, set the date for the <laughs> launch because I had a big launch gig planned on the 4th of April. And then of course, lockdown happened. No! <laughs> and I was like, oh no, no, I had so much to like create, do this big launch gig it was going to be at H Club in London and had a band planned and everything. Um, but then I was like, okay, well, we'll just have to do it online instead. So I l learned how to live stream, um, learned how to, like, like I said to you, learned how to record. I'd never recorded at home. I recorded my EP in a studio. So like, it's okay. We'll just, it's like when life throws you these things, then you're like, well, I've got no choice now. <laughs> I have to, have to try and learn it. Um, and you know what that, like I ended up opening up a whole new, avenue for me because I enjoyed doing the live stream for the EP launch and uh, so then I've ended up live streaming a lot ever since but yeah the EP itself uh, it feels like a labour of love and I've got to embark on the next one now but you know like before you start a project you're like super excited but also like really scared about where do I begin I've got all these ideas I've got all these next EPs planned out like I know how I want it to be but like oh, I've got to, how do I start where do I start I've got got to start this process <laughs> yeah I know what you're saying but at least now that you've done one you've had that experience you kind of know what it all involves and it's that doing your first one's the hardest one definitely the yeah. other thing to remember with it as well when uh, I say to artists that are just starting out is that you don't have to do everything all at once you know you've got to eat this massive tree but you know just do it one leaf at a time <laughs> that's good advice. Do it. so that's good it, advice like that's why album cycles take so long isn't it because you do have all of these jobs that you've got to do and so if you just plan it out in your year you know by this month i need to have done this and by this month i need to have done that you know then it, it makes it more bite size, like having a leaf yeah. at a time yeah <laughs> such a cute that's such a cute analogy I love it <laughs> <laughs> but with your debut EP have you got your own material on there or is there covers as well or is it just just stuff that you've written 
it's just just my songs on on the ep yeah just all um wrote them by myself and so i'm the only writer on them but i did get a couple of musicians to feature in the recordings but i did all the arrangements and yeah like i say the production which happened like kind of by i guess it just i i started by going okay i'm just going to record it like voice piano guitar and i worked with another musician who did who did some voice and guitar for me robert tyra wilson and then i was like well what if i'm gonna i'm gonna add some harmonies because you know i've got this i love doing harmonies it's my job but i love it like i'll never sing the tune when i'm singing along to something on the radio i'm, I'm only ever singing the harmony <laughs> like yes harmony. yeah I feel, honestly i feel like i'm looking in the mirror at you there yeah that's yeah. me <laughs> <laughs> always my, my my family hate it they're just like oh will you just sing the tune it's so <laughs> annoying that you're always singing some random other melody like just sing the tune <laughs> and no, i'm like but that's the I fun want the i want to sing the harmony exactly <laughs> that is the fun <laughs> so i was like okay i've got to put some harmonies on these and then i ended up like writing these like really <laughs> like six part choral like backing and stuff i put all these harmonies on them and i was like Oh, it's kind of like sounding a bit bigger now. Like I th wonder, I could I could probably like add some harp to this. So I did a day in the studio with the orchestral harp, and like that was really exciting because it's like not only like involved harp parts like arpeggiation and stuff like that, but then also discovered that if if I could use the bass notes, we can like put some effects on, so it, it almost sounds like an electric bass. So all the bass on the record is actually harp; it's not an electric bass. Um, and That's so then I was so like. Cool. Which is cool, isn't it? Like, and and it, even since then, I've discovered more that you can do with the harp when you're recording with like effects afterwards and plugins and like a lot of interesting textures. And so it just like, every stage of the way is just like, oh, what if I add this now? And like, what if I add this? And then we did a day with drums, and then got a uh, my friend who's a cellist to come in and record on one track and electric guitar we added, which is a great like textural thing to put in you know and then it just kind of grew and then I was kind of like wow I didn't think it was going to be that I wanted it to be that at the start but I didn't think it was going to be that but it was a uh, is exciting process because there's just something so I exciting about creating something brand new which is another thing that I felt kind of somewhat stifled by had I only been in the classical world like these beautiful classical works exist and I love performing them singing them listening to them but there's also a real great excitement in the creative process of creating something new F first of all writing I mean I love writing it's just I mean you could go anywhere with it you know it's so it's like therapy as well <laughs> And, and then in the production process and, and, and the ways that a, a song could be so many different things like just this week somebody did a remix of one of my songs a dance remix and I'm just like what I didn't think that song could ever sound like that what that's 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 crazy I'm not that cool how did it sound cool <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting. I actually worked with a writer once who said, if it will work in reggae, it will work. So at the end of every session, we'd play this classical crossover song that we'd written in reggae and to see if it works or not. <laughs> that is so amazing. I never heard that before. And also, I really, can you send me a recording of you singing it in reggae? <laughs> <laughs> Should have recorded it, sugar. <laughs> Yeah, next time. <laughs> oh, you need to record it. I want to hear you singing your your songs in reggae style. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. I just, I'm so glad to hear that your EP became what you imagined in your head. Because it's quite scary, as you say, starting out at the beginning going, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So the fact that you were able to create what you heard in your head is just such an amazing achievement. And we're definitely going to link to your EP in the description below so that everybody can hear it if they wanted to find you um where is the best place to find you now i know of one place in particular and that is live streaming on twitch so do you want to tell us about that uh yeah so i'm now as of you know 
Well, I started live streaming, like I say, for my EP launch last April. And then I started a weekly Facebook, YouTube, Periscope live stream. And just really enjoyed it. Like, there's something really great about live streaming where you're getting to interact with people in a way that you don't in the live gig context. I mean, obviously, I really miss gigging live as well. And that's a whole other joy and wonderful thing but in the absence of that like looking for silver linings um it's nice that you can have more feedback from audience because it's like a more of a dialogue so in the course of last year and my live streams i ended up creating a music video with with my fans because i was like okay i'm going to bring out the last single from the ep i want to do a music video what if we do it together and so they all sent me video clips and we put together a music video and I'm not sure that that would ever have happened otherwise uh, and they also encouraged me to get merch like because they came up with like a slogan keep calm and carry on <laughs> I love it <laughs> <laughs> um, which is my name but in case anyone's seen carry on written down and just like doesn't realize that's how it's pronounced because it's Welsh. Um, so <laughs> I got I got all this merch made with Keep Calm and Carry On, which I wouldn't have done if it had not been for them. And they're also very kind and said that they liked the art that I do alongside my music. So that's become like much more a part of uh, everything that I do alongside, you know, the, my band camp store and the merch and stuff. Um, and then I ended up m moving to Twitch in September, which is a live streaming platform which is mainly known for gaming, but has a very strong and active music community as well. And uh, I just became a Twitch partner, which was exciting. Woo! And <laughs> and it's I now stream three times a week on Twitch and have got, there's just such an amazing music community there. People that love music and are really supportive. And I've met loads of other streamers, musicians, streamers um, who are brilliant and it's just it's really good it's really good fun <laughs> that's so cool so we can definitely join you live on twitch three times a week um mm -hmm. and you also said about these other places facebook periscope Bandcamp. um where's the best place for people to come and hang out with you outside of twitch how do we find you um well carry on music is uh, on all the socials so at carry on music my website is carry music.com so whichever your preferred platform is really i've got I'm, I'm on you know instagram facebook twitter youtube discord um and the Bandcamp store as well it's just search carry on music basically <laughs> perfect and we're definitely going to link to all of those below so you'll be able to go into the description and choose your favorite social media platform and then go and follow carry on on there and that is very important because especially with the pandemic still ongoing even a follow or a subscribe or something just really helps us out doesn't it it really does it's like everything is algorithms these days mm -hmm. and so if you have more people that have clicked follow or like it like helps the algorithms and it helps your discoverability because you know as independent artists we don't exactly have much of a budget at all for marketing and i think audiences don't realize how much marketing is key in everything we see sometimes you're scrolling on things and you don't realize it's it's paid for advertising how do you get people to see something new unless you're paying for them to see it, which we can't do most of the time. So yeah, if anybody can just click like and that really helps those discoverability algorithms. <laughs> yeah, you're completely right. And when are you live streaming on Twitch? What are the days? Monday, Tuesday and Thursday. Perfect. Well, go and join Carrie Ann Monday, Tuesday and Thursday on Twitch and follow and subscribe to all of her other channels. And Carrie Ann, thank you so much for joining me today on the Mary Just Meets podcast. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Really thank you. It. I will speak to you again soon. Speak to you soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye.